reverberation. This mesmerizing, intimate landscape image got an excellence in the National Image Salon of the Professional Photographers of Canada, PPOC, in 2019. It was selected the best in class for pictorial and floral category and was part of the loan collection. Today, we will talk to the maker and find out how this was photographed. Welcome to Award-Winning Images Explained. My name is Manpreet and I am your host. Today we have a very special guest. He's a close friend of mine and an all-around amazing guy. Based in Abbotsford, BC in Canada, Steve Pelton, who has earned the designation of Craftsman of Photography Arts, is an aerial, product and corporate photographer. Besides globetrotting, all over the world photographing unique images for large fine art prints. Welcome, Steve. Well, thank you, Manpreet. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and to be able to uh, you know, share uh, some information about some of my images. So, Steve, today you are quite active with PPOC BC, which is Professional Photographers of Canada, BC. You are the chair for honors and awards, as well as for BC competition. You are also a recipient of several awards yourself. Tell us about your background with a special emphasis on how you got started with photography. Well, um, way back in the 60s when the Apollo space program was going on, I was, of course, really, really interested in that. And I actually photographed uh, Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon. Oh, and, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, I did that from my living room on the black and white TV that we had, and I had a little fold-out Kodak camera with the, you know, the lens at the end, 120 film. I think it was my grandpa's or something like that. And uh, I sat in front of the TV and took photos of uh, Neil Armstrong on that epic, uh, you know, technolo technological achievement of reaching the moon. So mm -hmm. that was my first foray into photography. And miraculously, I learned how to develop the film, actually make a few little prints on this cheap and larger that I had. And I was bitten by the photography bug. And, you know, uh, through high school, I, I ended up with a Pentax Botmatic camera and uh, I ended up uh, photographing the high school annual, the, every photograph in the entire annual uh, was mine. And mm -hmm. uh, so that was the first time I was published. So, but then, you know, uh, you, you pick a career and you off you go on that journey. And, you know, then you meet someone, you get married, you start having kids. Uh, my photography more or less went dormant, fell by the wayside, but I always did have a camera and, uh, you know, took family snaps and, you know, but I wasn't very serious in photography, so. But during my career, I uh, I was involved in silviculture, which is the culture of trees for reforestation. And that was my career for 30 years or more. And one of the biggest issues we had in silviculture was, was knowing when the trees had set bud. And just through the, through the powers of observation and, you know, feedback, I was always constantly looking at trees, trying to figure out when they had set bud. It's a very Im important physiological step uh, when you're cultivating trees. Through all this, you know, observation of feedback, I managed to find or train my brain to actually see many, many colors of green. And I would be able to walk into a a nursery and look at some trees and say well those ones over there they've sat bud and the ones over here they have not and my colleagues at the time they call they kind of called me out on it and said well bs i don't think you can see it and so i went to my optometrist and asked them if they could check me for that and they did 
and I could actually see about three times as many shades of green as the average person. Mm. So that led me to think, well, you know what? How do I convey this knowledge? I, I need to document it. So I thought, well, I have a camera. I'm a photographer. I can do this. But of course, this is in the early 90s, and it was film. So, But I took my camera, and I set up a controlled light and all that thing to minimize the variables. And I started photographing literally hundreds of trees, thousands of trees. Well, I learned very quickly that that was a waste of time. It was a total failure. There's just too many variables, <laughs> you know, from the film, whether, you know, I stuck with one type of film, but, you know, the fact whether the film was new or old or the chemistry that the negatives got developed in, uh, uh, you know, the time of year. Uh, and then, of course, there's more variables yet, even in the printing. So mm -hmm. in the end, there's no way that we could pick up the nuances in the green with the camera. So the project lay dormant for a couple of years until 1999 when Nikon uh, came out with the Nikon D1. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, okay, this, this is going to work because I can remove all the variables of processing uh, by going digital. Wow. Little did I know that uh, I was going down another technological rabbit hole. Uh, even though the Nikon was a powerhouse image machine with its whopping 2.7 megapixels, <laughs> <laughs> it had all sorts of problems. Yeah. Uh, but I stuck through it, and I kept working, and uh, it took me about three years, and I did manage to achieve what I set out to do. So, mm -hmm. it, But that got me, you know, because I had to learn everything about the camera uh, and how to produce... Uh, you know, I would say color accurate images. Uh, it got my, it rekindled my interest in photography and I started uh, using the camera for shooting landscapes in my hometown, which was Maple Ridge at the time, just outside of Vancouver. And, but Maple Ridge has got plenty of parks and forests and lakes and rivers. And so it's a great place to do landscape photography. So that actually brings us right into yep. the, your, uh, your shot that we're going to talk about, talking That's about right. tones or shades of green and landscape. Um, this particular amazing image, green reverberation, um, it seems like almost like an aerial shot. And I, I know you do aerials uh, professionally as well. How did you manage to take this shot? What was give us some background into um, this image, how you got the inspiration and how you took it. Uh, well, this shot, uh, Green Reverberation, was taken in the, the Palouse region of eastern Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a park there called Steptoe Butte, and it's a state park. And the, and the photo is taken from that vantage point. Uh, I mean, uh, the Palouse is a relatively famous uh, landscape photography area. I'm, I'm sure most people have seen some shots from there. Uh, but Steptoe Butte, which is this big rock outcropping that comes out of the prairie, it's about 1,100 meters high, and uh, there's no other rocks or hills around it. So you have this complete un unobstructed view of the prairie and these ro beautiful rolling hills. Uh, you can see hundreds of miles into the distance there. And the whole area is what's called dry land farming, which means there's no irrigation. They're not uh, irrigating the land for the crops. They're relying on uh, Mother Nature to do the irrigation. So the landscape is uh, not cut up by, uh, by irrigation equipment or that type of thing. So it's quite pristine and it's very unique. And, and due to the uh, undulating hills at sunrise and sunset, you get this amazing light that plays across the landscape. And that's one of the big attractions to the Palouse. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, uh, the green reverberation was a, uh, a morning shot, a sunrise shot. And uh, it was quite challenging. Um, number one, there's just compositions everywhere. 
and you you know as a landscape photographer you you have to quiet down because there's one over there and there's one over there and and, mm -hmm. and the, the light moves very quickly like in a matter of minutes it changes dramatically so mm -hmm. you have to be prepared and in order to get a shot you need to actually slow down and just focus on one area and get the right shot if you jump around a little bit too much uh, you probably just get a bunch of mediocre shots <laughs> but uh, this shot as we'll get into it in a minute uh, was shot almost directly into the Sun mm. uh, I saw the composition sort of when it was twilight but I didn't realize that as the Sun came up it was gonna actually come up right into my camera mm -hmm. so when the Sun did crest the hill uh, the shots I couldn't get it so I had to wait a little bit till the Sun rose mm -hmm. and then I started capturing it so so this is where the Palouse is just to mm -hmm. give everybody a little bit of background uh, the Palouse is uh, actually it's about seven hours from Vancouver and uh, you can see Spokane uh, Spokane over here and Steptoe Butte is near the town of Colfax it's about halfway between uh, uh, Spokane and Lewiston Idaho and this whole area and this is dryland farming and it's wheat fields primarily wheat and sorghum mm -hmm. uh, and it's unique I, I believe the the hills were formed by glaciation by the dropping but Steptoe Butte itself is very 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 old rock and way back when that was the edge of the ocean actually mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. So it's a, a very unique geological area. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what it looks like in full sunlight. It's mm -hmm. really not too inspiring, although it's, uh, um, you know, there's patterns you can photograph. Uh, and the, the, the different colors you see are different stages of the wheat developing. Uh, some may be uh, germinating, some are just, some of the fields are just tilled and others are actually uh, drought stressed the mm -hmm. yellower portions uh, the wheat has actually gone to seed so uh, but even in midday if you go there you can find uh, compositions that are kind of fun but mm -hmm. it's it's you know more of abstract intimate mm -hmm. landscapes mm -hmm. and you you need a longer lens mm -hmm. But the real magic starts to happen when the sun goes down or the sun is rising. Uh, and, you know, you start to see the shadows develop on the rolling hills. And this is what it looks like uh, standing in the parking lot. I mean, it's easy access. Uh, and you can, there's uh, communication towers on top. So you have this constant hum in your background. But uh, you can walk around the top and shoot in any direction. And I believe mm -hmm. that's looking uh, northeast. Okay. And from there, you're going to get these classic uh, Palouse shots. Like this is the uh, the Whitman grain growers uh, silos. It's um, you know it's it's a classic iconic shot from there. Um, and there these rolling hills and the way the light plays across the landscape, uh, it's just fantastic. It's you just sit up top and take the shots. But as the sun goes down, mm -hmm. that's when in just those few minutes as the sun goes down or the sun comes up, that's mm -hmm. when the real magic goes. Mm -hmm. And it's very quick. It matter, mm -hmm. you know, a shot like this is gone in five seconds. Yeah. Um, and there's a variety of of things to shoot there it's not yeah. just limited to uh to the you know there's windmills there's uh there's farms there's the rolling hills there's even sunsets are pretty spectacular from the area and so, talking like, of shooting what kind of gear did you use to take that picture i shot this with a nikon d 800e mm -hmm. and uh and a 600 millimeter f4 do you remember the settings Oh yeah, um, one five hundredth of a second at f four. Um, mm -hmm. Shot wide open. 
Uh, this, I think I mentioned earlier that the initially I couldn't get the shot because I was shooting straight into the sun. And uh, I had, I actually photographed a couple of other shots and I came back to it because, you know, muscle memory, I remembered exactly where it was because you're really just being like a sniper with a long lens and it's actually easy to lose your place, to lose your composition. And were you on a tripod? Yeah, yeah, I'm on yeah. a tripod, but mainly because the lens is, I didn't need it, well, 500 you probably do, but uh, mainly because the lens is so darn heavy. No, and plus I know, I've, I've photographed from Steptoe Butte and it's quite windy up there. It can be, yes. Yeah, I yeah. don't know when you were shooting, was it that windy or not, but when I was there, it was quite uh, quite a breeze. Yeah, yeah, the wind, there's really nothing to stop the wind moving yes. across the prairie. So, uh, yeah, you're right. It can be a challenge there. Yeah. I don't recall on this day what it was like. Mm -hmm. So this is the image straight out of the camera. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, uh, it lacks a lot of contrast. And I chose this composition because... Uh, I'm quite enamored with the two little bushes yeah. down uh, along there uh, because they're survivors. The story sort of evolves around those two little bushes. And I think Jay Maisel, he calls it the gesture. Mm -hmm. A landscape image, or any image, uh, to be successful you know, obviously it needs good composition and post-processing and all that, but it, to really push it over the top, you need something called what he calls the gesture. And I, mm -hmm. I, I subscribe to his uh, way of thinking. And the gesture in this image is the two little bushes. Mm -hmm. If they're removed, the image loses its impact. Yes. And the story around the bushes are that they are survivors because they're right along a fence line. Mm -hmm. And... The farmers and their cultivators can't get them, so they, you know, they were lucky enough to germinate and grow right along the line between two properties where uh, the tractors and the implements can't get at them. So, uh, if you look in the photo and even around in the area, you find there's very few uh, these wayward. Uh, you, you could call them weeds. Uh, farmers would call them weeds because they will shed seed and cause contamination to the to the crop mm -hmm. uh, so they usually will eradicate them but these two guys survived nice. so the story around this image is uh, i took this in 2017 and in 2018 i joined the ppoc mm -hmm. and i had to go through accreditation like everyone and I chose this image as one of my accreditation images. Mm -hmm. And I had a mentor, and I had met a few people in PPOC, and I, you know, you know, there's trepidation about entering accreditation for the first time. So I showed this image with some others to my mentor and other people. And the first thing everybody said was, well, of course, it needs more contrast. And... I was like, right, yeah, but everybody said there might be something there. So, actually, this was this was the image that I was I had shown uh, the mentors and my PPOC friends, mm -hmm. and you know you can see that you know I had increased the contrast a bit, but it lacked it lacked punch. Mm -hmm. So uh, I took took their advice, and I made a lot. I cropped it. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, there was some other colors uh, up at the top that were a bit distracting, mm -hmm. and I put more contrast in it. And it went through accreditation, but during accreditation, part of the feedback was the judge said it could use more contrast. So, <laughs> oh, okay, more contrast. So I did that, and then I ended up submitting it to the BC Image Competition. Mm -hmm. and it did well there. I got an excellence. Uh, I think this would be the image that was put into the BC. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the judge's comments was, 
nice image, but it could use more contrast. <laughs> so again, <laughs> I, of course, I, I, at this point, my Photoshop skills were not as good as they are today. And I kind of thought I had exhausted my ways of introducing contrast to the image. So I went to, I dodged and burned it to uh, increase the contrast. And mm -hmm. then I, it went on to uh, to the Nationals, and that was the image that went to the Nationals. Mm -hmm. And if you flip back and forth, you can see the slight change in uh, the, the cropping, mm -hmm. as well as the increase in contrast. Mm -hmm. And at the Nationals, it's initially scored um, one excellence, two merit, and two accepted, and it got recalled twice. Uh, or one was a challenge, I believe, and, uh, uh, and then a recall. But in the end, uh, it came out with uh, three excellence and two merits and received an excellence. Very good. And one of the judge's comments was, uh, very good contrast. <laughs> a good contrast <laughs> transition. So well, one of the morals of the story was to, um, you know, listen to, to what the, your mentors and your colleagues say and uh, pay attention to the feedback because it could take an image that, you know, was pretty lackluster all the way to, you know, to getting, well, I got the best in class uh, as well. And uh, it's in the loan collection. So. <laughs> You no, know, and I think I've seen I've seen this image uh, on the wall. Uh, I think it's a metal print in your house, and it is a stunning image. And often I ask photographers as to how competitions have helped you, and this is a perfect example of how um, listening to feedback given by uh, judges, you have taken your image, you know, at a higher and higher scale. Uh, in, in, in its quality and uh, ended up with something that is spectacular. Well, thanks. Uh, th this image actually is one of my best-selling images. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it works in a lot of uh, situations and mm -hmm. I've got a lot of mileage out of this image. Mm -hmm. It evokes emotion out of people in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I love to ask people why, like what do they see in the image? Mm -hmm. You know, some people don't see the the power of the two little trees. Other people mm -hmm. just see, you know, the the title "Green Reverberation" mm -hmm. uh, and and the harmonious colors, and that's to them that's what it's about. Yeah. Others, you know, lock onto the pattern and the repeating pattern. Mm -hmm. Others don't even see that there's actually a road dissecting mm -hmm. across the bottom third mm -hmm. uh, of the image. Other people see it right away and say, you know, well, that introduces a touch of humanity into yeah. into the image. You know, uh, this is, I think this is one image that really could grow on you if you have this up on your wall. Um, every time uh, you'll probably see something totally new. Yeah, and it's I, a fun image. I, yeah. I, my, my landscape images tend to be uh, uplifting bright and cheery mm -hmm. and this one certainly uh, is in that category and um, i think those two trees um is where the uh, center of interest is um and it's like in in the classic uh two-third you know intersection um without them the image is not the same that's correct yes. yeah it loses uh almost all of its impact Yes. Now, now this is what we uh, call as an intimate image, intimate landscape. Mm -hmm. um, when you're standing there, I know I've stood there, so I, uh, I'm aware of this, and you look around, you see the expanse all around you. But honing in on one composition like this and blocking out everything requires a special skill. Not everybody can do it. What how would you say how would you what would you suggest to somebody who wants to create intimate landscapes like this what is it that you do to um you know 
chalk out different intimate landscapes from an expanse? Uh, well, the first thing is it has to become your way of seeing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, the more you look, the more you'll find. Uh, I would suggest you get a longer lens and just start looking around at a landscape and see what you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is, interestingly, there's a current movement in landscape photography away from the grand vistas and the iconic hero shots of different areas. I mean, social media and the internet has flooded our inboxes and our brains with loads of imagery, mm -hmm. particularly of iconic landscapes. And mm -hmm. now we've become, uh, those, those images have become commonplace and they're not exciting anymore. We've just sort of been bombarded with them. Mm -hmm. And if you sign up for workshops, I mean, mm -hmm. they promise to take you to the secret spot at the right time and you'll get a similar shot. Mm -hmm. But you'll get a shot that, you know, hundreds or even thousands of photographers have. Yeah. It might be interesting as a developing photographer, but it's not that creative nowadays. Mm -hmm. So intimate landscapes, they're really fun. You have to hunt for them. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a game. Mm -hmm. And really importantly for photographers is that they hold their value photographically because they're really difficult to uh, you know locate and copy yeah. it's almost impossible and matter of fact i've been back to steptoe since i took this shot and i can't mm -hmm. find it <laughs> <laughs> so uh i mean that just sort of demonstrates it yeah. maybe the two trees are gone now i don't know yeah. Yeah. but uh it's uh it's interesting uh, that uh, the intimate yep. landscape uh, sort of world mm -hmm. is, uh, I think it's very exciting because you can do it anywhere. You yes. could do it in your backyard. You can do it down the street. You can do it at a park. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to go to a place that, uh, you know, far away and it's costly. Yeah. You can do it anywhere. Yeah. So that's one of the powers of lands of intimate landscapes. And you can do it at a grand level or a macro level. Yes. Yeah, yes. even macro work is like yeah. the intimate intimate landscapes. That's yes. a whole nother a whole nother step. Yeah. Now you are uh, also the chair of honors and awards as well as BC competition. What would you say? I mean, you've already already answered part of that um uh, that entering a competition does improve uh, a photographer's work and you've literally shown that. But the first time a person is entering and they are, they do not achieve what they were hoping to, isn't that disheartening? Uh, certainly, it can be. Uh, mm -hmm. But my advice is, you know, don't take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're really just talking about, about a bunch of pixels. It's not an attack on your personal character. It's really difficult to see anything but failure when your images are rejected. But rejection and failure is common in every aspect of life. And, you know, success isn't really about the end result. It's about what you learn along the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it does take some dedication and work and, you know, some devotion to, yeah. to the things you want to see happen. Yeah, yes. Um, well, those were really some gems there, uh, Steve. Thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, for sharing uh, how, you, how you got that image. Um, now, where uh, can our viewers see more of your work or, or reach you if they want to, uh, you know, get your services? Uh, my, my primary website, well, my only website, is bellavistaphoto.com. Mm -hmm. And Bella Vista... Uh, there's a little story around that. Uh, it means beautiful view, of course, uh, in Spanish. But it's also the name of my grandparents' farm in Bella Coola in mm -hmm. British Columbia. And so the Bella Vista farm is still there. But as a child, I grew up there and I spent until I was the age of six with my grandparents. And of course, I have extremely fond memories of uh, being on my grandparents' farm. So I named my website after their farm. And it also ties in with my philosophy on landscape photography. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for listening. If you like this video, make sure to give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Manpreet. And yeah. thank you for doing these, uh, these programs. I mean, I've watched um, almost all of them. And uh, even though I know a lot of the people in the, uh, that are presenting, I, I love hearing the backstory because yeah. it's often extremely enlightening and very different than what you imagine uh, uh, happened. So.